So I'm glad to be here, and I'm excited to participate uh, in this morning's worship. Um, I want you to join me to appreciate our leaders. I think they've done a good job. Please do join me. Appreciate our leaders. Clap your hands, please. Uh, also join me to appreciate the, the worship team. They did a tremendous job. I was sitting here thinking, if I'm in today's uh, service, I must bring someone next week because this worship was wonderful. Thank you for leading us in that worship. You just lifted us and took us to the second heaven, so the third heaven, I don't know where, but they did a good job, and we praise the Lord for that. So this morning, as our leaders have told us, as the church, we are looking at uh, that theme, Be ye holy as I am holy. So, um, thank you. I, I would like us to uh, read as much as possible from God's word because God's word is the authority. I will say a few words and then I will ask you to read God's word. So, be ready with your E or, or, or hard copy Bibles so that we refer to a number of scriptures because the scripture is the basis for what we believe. As we went through the creed, I thought I would just mention this as I start. In our creed, which we have just recited, we are just confirming that we believe in the triune God. We believe in God who exists in Trinity. One God, but revealed to us in three forms. As the Father who created the heavens and the earth, as the Son, who out of the tree on them accepted to come and be part of us and buy us out of bondage of sin, and as the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So one God, but demonstrated to us in, as human beings in three forms. And we have just said that we do believe it. Do you believe it? That is our distinction as Christians. If anyone does not believe God as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, know that that person has an issue. If you join a fellowship and you discover that they either just think of the Holy Spirit and they don't respect the centrality and the sovereignty of Christ, or they don't respect the sovereignty of the overall Godhead, then know that there is a problem there, there is falsehood, and run away very fast. So as we open our words, the word of God to share it, let us pray together again. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come before you to say thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for creating us. Thank you for sustaining us. Thank you for giving us homes where we came from. Thank you that we have an opportunity here at church to meet as young people and share your word. Thank you, Lord. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and be in our midst. Come and speak to us all. Come and speak through me, Lord, as your channel and bless us together as we think of how we can be in your presence and remain holy as you demand of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So as um, has just been um, uh, told to us, our theme for today is uh, from 1 Peter chapter uh, 1, verse 15. It was read for us very well, uh, but I'll just read it again. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Verse 16, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So, the Lord is inviting us to be holy. And you may be thinking, what does it mean to be holy? Is it possible for human beings to be holy? Is God being honest in calling us to be holy? Can we make it? To be holy means to be sacred. 
It means to be consecrated, to be set apart for God. That is what it means to be holy. Set apart for God. Set apart for God. I loved it in the song, that, um, the, the scripture that is in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 9. That because Jesus, from the context of chapter 2 Philippians, because Jesus humbled himself, accepted to be a servant for our sake, died on the cross, because he did that, he was given a name that is above every other name. Do you know some big names in history or even today? Some big names it can be a political name. It can be an invent, a, a name of a person who invented something. Do you know some names? Can I hear from you? Let's just have about four names. Four big names. Names that people always talk about or wish to talk about. Yes. Hitler. Have you heard about Hitler? Who destroyed so many millions of Jews and caused havoc. His name is in the history books. Okay. It's a name that is known. Any other name? Yes? Napoleon. Can you tell us what he did? Okay, um, <clears throat> Napoleon uh, did so many things. Um, he was a warrior. Oh, let me say, um, he used to, um, to, <laughs> how can I say? Anyway, so Napoleon was this guy who was um, who had a cruel or let me say a harsh heart. Uh, he couldn't accept challenges. Yeah. So this man was I uh, remember he was put in jail. Yeah. It was um, okay. <laughs> uh, can we clap for him? But I'm sure you all know the name Napoleon. Do you? Yes. You've heard about it. If you haven't this afternoon, you just Google it and find out. Any other name? Uh, we have heard from here, we've heard from there. We need someone from here and then there, then we'll be done. Any other big name, great name? Uh, the ladies are being shy uh, this morning. I don't know why. Julius Caesar. Uh, he was the king of Rome. He was the one who was ruling. He, he ruled, I think, almost half the world at a certain point. And also he was the one oppressing the Jews during the time of Jesus. Right, so uh, those guys who are big kings, occupying great nations and wielding big armies and being submitted to by everybody. Any other name before I get back? Another great name? Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth, yes. She's a recent big name, isn't it? Yes, from my parents' time, to my time, to your time, we all knew about Queen Elizabeth because she was ruling um, the Great Britain, as they call themselves, a, a nation that at one time had almost conquered the whole world. I'm sure your history tells you so. Yes, so she was a great name. Um, any other name? But we know what great names are. But this scripture from which our song came from says that Jesus... <clears throat> Not because he killed people and, you know, was a great king and had a lot of wealth or what. But because he humbled himself, died on the cross for you and me to be redeemed from the bondage of sin. He was given a name that is above every other name. Hallelujah. Jesus' name is above every other name on earth and in heaven. And because his name is the greatest, at the name of Jesus, every knee, every knee, regardless of what the person thinks he is, how much wealthy he is, how much beautiful or handsome, how much talented, how much money, how much anything, whether he belongs to a pagan community or uh, Islam or Catholicism, every knee under heaven, every knee will bow to the name of Jesus. 
And what this song was telling us was, when you accept Jesus and bow to him voluntarily, you become a friend of Jesus. You know, when you have a friend, I've seen it um, on weddings, you know, um, the, 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 oh, these days, even on engagements, you know, the man even bends and kneels because he loves that, yeah? Yes, yes. So, when you are bowing for someone you love, it's very exciting, isn't it? Yeah, they even take pictures and post. But at one time, every knee shall bow, whether you accept it. So, imagine when you are bowing as a rebel. If there are two armies fighting and you are the rebel group and you have been overpowered, you are meant to surrender, isn't it? So, those who reject Jesus now, now, in their lives now, we have to bow before him as rejects, as people who will be under condemnation. What a sad story. So thank you for that song. It was a wonderful song, and I thought I would bring it up before delving into that message today. So, so today, we are looking at being holy. So I'll try to run through fast, because I know that our time is fast spent. Why is God calling us to be holy? Why? I'll put down a few points, and I'll go through them very quickly. One is that he himself is holy. Look at verse 16. Have you seen verse 16? Yes, it says, Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. God himself is holy. So, if we are to relate with him, if we are to be in his company, if we are to be in his fellowship, we need to be like him. So because God is holy, he calls us to be holy. Two, God greatly values fellowship with human beings. Greatly. If you open your Bibles and one of you read for us, when you get there, just stand and read Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. When you get there, just read. God values fellowship with us, the human beings. Are you there? Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Uh, kindly stand when you get it and, and read. 26 and 27. Is anyone there yet? Yes, she's there. Uh, it says, Genesis chapter 1, 26, 27. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Thank you very much for that. So, God created us in his own image. And he created us to be co-governors of his earth, which he has created. If you go down there on verse 28, you read that God gave authority to human beings to rule over all creation, all creation. So, if we think about it in the human terms, you probably would say God remained the president the ruler of heaven and earth, but man became the vice president to oversee the earth. But he created us in his own image. In fact, in chapter 2, uh, verse, I think, 8, um, someone can just turn a page and get there. Uh, chapter 2, I think, verse 8, it tells us that after he had molded man in the, in the dust of the, of, of the ground, he breathed his Holy Spirit. I think it's verse 7. Is anyone there? Verse 7 of chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 7. Is anyone there yet? Yes? Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. Thank you very much. So we became living creatures because God breathed in us. What did he breathe in us? He breathed in us his Holy Spirit. 
So the holiness of God was breathed into man on creation. In other words, we have inherent potential for holiness. Praise the Lord. So he created us in his image. He breathed in us his spirit. And so we have the potential to be holy right from the beginning. But you know that something happened because you'd say, but madam, when we see the streets of Kampala and we see what is happening in our schools and universities and in our fellowships, we don't see that holiness. So what happened? What happened is recorded in Genesis chapter 3. Kindly find time to read it this afternoon. But man used that freedom that God had given him to choose to rebel. He chose to disobey God. He chose to do things God had told him not to do. I don't know when you were at school. Some of you are still at school. If you had people being punished for breaking school rules, did you? Yes. They came in. They read the school rules. They signed on them with their parents. Did you sign? Anyone who signed school rules with your parents at the bottom there, at the beginning of S1 or S5? Just put your hand up. Only these ones. I'm sure all of us did. So, but after some time, they, the school rules are saying we don't, we, we don't accept drinking alcohol, we don't accept smoking, we don't accept people who go out of school without permission, and you sign on them. And then a few weeks later, you hear, oh, this one is being suspended. What has happened? He was called from outside the school. So we do not have the capacity to do what we want to do because our grandparents rebelled against God. When they rebelled against God, that authority and holiness that was being reflected in their relationship with God was broken. Man became a sinner and God remained holy and righteous. And a great, great chasm was created between us, the human beings who are sinners, and God who is holy. Did that change God's nature? No. He remained loving, he remained caring, but we had chosen to go our own way. And because of that, we now became slaves of sin. Jesus teaches in John chapter 8, verse 34. And he says, if anyone sins, he or she becomes a slave of sin. And yet Paul writes to the uh, Romans chapter 3, verse, verse 23, and says, all of us have sinned. Okay? All of us have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. So in our human nature... In our human fallen nature, we do not have the capacity to be holy as God is holy. But because of his love and his nature, he is love, he is faithful, he does not change. Because of his love, he reached out for us. He reached out for us. He came and took up our human form. And we normally celebrate Christmas. How many of you have celebrated Christmas? Let me see those who don't celebrate Christmas. Yeah, great. So, on Christmas, we are being reminded of God's love. We are being reminded that there, in our sinfulness, we had broken God's law. We were under condemnation. We were waiting for the wrath of God. Paul writes the Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 3, and he says, Before you came to Christ, you were like the rest of mankind, objects of God's anger, God's wrath. So when we are still living in sin, separated from God, we are under condemnation. And we could never get ourselves out. We could never make ourselves holy again. So God in his love came, he took your punishment and mine, he took your sin and mine, and he went and paid the total price himself on the cross. And that is why we celebrate Easter. We celebrate Easter because this Jesus who came was born like us, 
walk through this life like us, got tired like us, got misunderstood like us, ate the food we eat, you know? This Jesus who was in the human form now took up your sin and my sin and went to the cross of Calvary because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So his blood was shed on the cross of Calvary and from then on, the bridge was made. Hallelujah. The bridge was made between the sinful man and the holy God. There's a scripture that we all know, John chapter 3, verse 16. You remember it? Can someone say it out for us? John 3, 16. Please say it loud, kindly. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So, yes, God himself, through Jesus Christ, paid the price, okay? But we have to do something. Did you hear what she said? What do we have to do? What is our part as human beings? We have to believe in him. We have to believe in him. In fact, John chapter 1, verse 12, does anyone know that one? John 1, 12, it's also a common verse. Our choir leader does. I see what I know. Um, it says, John chapter 1, verse 12 says, Yet to those who believed him, uh, believe, who received him, I think, and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of that, God. That's it, that okay. Um, John chapter 1, verse 5. I mean, verse 12 says, um, Yet to all who, be, who received him and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Hallelujah. So, the deal was done. Jesus paid the price. We don't have to pay it again. It was done once and for all. Hallelujah. But now, we have something to do. We have to receive him in our lives as our personal Savior and Lord. We have to believe in him. When we do that, he comes into our lives in the form of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And because he comes in us in the form of the Holy Spirit, we get the right to be children of God. Are there some who received him here and who believed in his name? Just put your hands up if you received him and believed in his name. Hallelujah. I want to assure you that if that is what you did, you now have the right to be a child of God. And God is the president of the president, the president of the universe, the king of kings, and the lord of lords. Hallelujah. What do we normally call sons of kings? Princes, okay? If there are many. If it's one, it's a prince. And if it's a lady, a daughter of a king, what do we call the daughters of kings? A princess, isn't it? So when you receive him and believe in him and enthrone him as your Lord and King, you become a prince or a princess. Hallelujah. Say amen to that one. Amen. I want to hear it loud. Amen. I mean, you know when I sing this song, I know who I am. So who are you? If you are not a prince and a princess, then who are you? You are a slave. But for those of us who have believed in Jesus, who have received him in our hearts, we are princes and princesses. Hallelujah. And because we have that new identity, that is why God is saying to us, be holy as I am holy. You have now come back into fellowship with me, and I am holy, and therefore I expect you I, 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 I command you to be holy even as I am holy. Praise the Lord. So, the good news is that it is possible to be holy. Not our own holiness, we don't have it. But because when you receive Jesus, his righteousness takes over. 
When God looks at you from heaven, he no longer sees Kedres who was, you know, who would tell lies, who would complain. No, because those ones, when you come to Christ and confess them, the blood of Jesus washes them. And now, when God looks at you from heaven, he sees his son, the Holy Spirit in you. He sees you as holy. Isn't that exciting? Yes, it is possible. It is possible to be holy, to once again live in fellowship with God. There's that song, uh, one of the verses I like. It says, when I kneel in prayer and uh, I pray to my God as a friend with friend, because he has made it possible for us. So what does he expect of us? Verse 14. He says, now that he has redeemed us, he has paid the price for our sin. Now that he has bridged that which separated us, for those who have accepted him, verse 14, he expects us to be obedient. To be obedient. Obedient to him, obedient to his word, obedient to our parents, obedient to our teachers, obedient to our employers, obedient. He says, be obedient and do not conform to the passions of your former ignorance. When you don't have Christ, you are living in ignorance. And what your life shows is actually ignorance. Because your life shows some of the things that we are going to read in Galatians chapter 5. Kindly turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. And you see people who are living in ignorance, how they look like. Galatians chapter 5, and we shall read from verse 19 up to verse 21. I would want a volunteer to help us read those scriptures. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 up to 21. Any volunteer? Volunteers? Yes, we have someone right there at the back. Kindly come forward. Just come running. It's nice to be young, eh? Uh, Galatians chapter 5, from verse 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immolarity, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, revolts, excuse me, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, uh, and, the, and things like these, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Thank you very much. So, those are characteristics of people we call ignorant. But when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ, he gives us power to move out of these. Impure thoughts, lustful thoughts, Watching of pornography, going out to bed with your fees, school fees and tuition and money. You know, orgies. Orgies means, uh, what is the current word you use? Hanging out. What is it? Yes, what is, that? What is the, the other word we would use for orgies? Huh? Right? D- different. It's, it's, it, it, it's actually, it's kind of partying, and it, it's that, it's that. Wild parties. You, you are saying, yeah, it's, it's, it's this, uh, what do you call them? There are some words I keep hearing, but they have escaped me. Um, it, those bashes which you go to and, 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 and dress naked and, you know, dance silly and, you know, you know I, I mean, you know them, isn't it? Wild, isn't it? Wild people are drinking beer and they are chewing uh, marijuana and they are, you know, they, they are just silly. So the scripture is saying those who accept Christ have already been pulled out of that ignorance. Okay? We know who we are, that we are princes and princesses. So we just don't get involved in those kinds of things. We don't get involved in watching pornography the whole night under our beds. 
lest our parents know it. We don't get involved in all kinds of mischief of just because I've posted on my Twitter page and nobody has liked, therefore I'm not liked. Hey, that is stupid. <laughs> Those who say they even like, they don't know you, they have nothing to do with you. It's just something people do. And these days, young people get so stressed. Have you had people saying I'm stressed? Yes, I have them in my house. They get stressed. <laughs> they get so stressed because of these little, little things, because the enemy has held you captive and you are still living in ignorance. You don't have to remain there. There is a savior who can set you free and give you wisdom and give you power of the Holy Spirit. Paul tells Timothy, Timothy was a young man like you. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7, he says you did not receive the spirit of timidity to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of power and love and self-control. So when you have that spirit in you, oh my goodness, you are a winner, not a loser. You are a victor and not a victim. You are above and not below. You are a head and not a tail. Hallelujah. So, when we are in Christ, verse 14 has told us that we should, be, um, we should have um, a conduct that demonstrates who we are. And so, he expects us in verse 14 to be obedient children, obey him, and all authorities he's given us are not conform, not conform. But uh, if I don't join them, they will think I'm boring, and then they will think I'm old-fashioned. <laughs> don't have to conform to their standards. Tell them my standard is getting home at seven. Yes. Set a standard. You are a child of the light. Set it and walk in it. Set, set it and do what? Walk in it. When they say, ah, you, I think you are a 20th century person, does that take you back to 20th century? No, you do not conform. So, God expects us to be obedient and not to conform. Then he also expects us, in verse 17, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout your time. We live in reverence to the Lord. This fear is not being scared and hiding under the bed it's being reverent to the Lord. In verse 13, we are told, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. We are sober-minded. Once we are in Christ, we are sober-minded. We are not swept by the wind. Then you set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Sober-mindedness. Sober mind, having a mind that is alert, that cannot be deceived by the funeral teachings. Yes. Sober. Because you know what God's word says, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if someone is teaching that, oh, the body doesn't mind matter, you know that that's rubbish. You just move off. Yes, you just move off. Sober minded. Sober minded, uh, that is in verse 13. Verse 17, you reverence God. And then in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 17, you become the light now. Because the light, because Christ is light and Christ dwells in you. So the light of Christ in you is radiated to others. You know, I'm sure you know from physics that the moon doesn't have light. Do you? Yes? Yes. The moon just reflects the light of the sun. So when Christ is in you, you are able to be the light. Like when we see the moon, we see that it's, it has light. You are able to be the light, not because you are the light, but because Christ who is light is dwelling in you. Hallelujah. You become the salt of the earth. What are the four main functions of salt? Four main functions of salt. Uh, someone who hasn't said a word, would you like to say something? Do you know anything about salt? Do you eat food? What is there? So what does salt do? Makes the food taste nice. Yes, food brings taste. It brings that 
tasting the food that makes it palatable to eat. So when we are the salt of the world, we, we are the test. We make people around us not stressed. Hmm? We don't make our parents be stressed. They are there, they want to close the gate at nine, but now they don't know where their young person is, and then they, they can't sleep. These women don't sleep. These women here, when the children are not there in time, you don't sleep. So you become a bitter thing. You become like a murder. But when you are a child who knows Christ and you are a child of the light and so you are coming home early, you are part of the family dinner and you are part of the family worship, ah, oh, you are the test. You are able to contribute to the discussion at home. You become a test. When your friends are suggesting things that will kill them, yes, when they are there saying, Ah, you know me, the, this last weekend, I had a bash and I slept with two girls. You look, at, you look at them in the face. You look at them in the face and you say, you, you are committing suicide. <laughs> yes, because first of all, AIDS is still here. And all kinds of things that go with sexual immorality. So you become the test of your group, don't you? Uh -huh. What other thing does salt do? Yes, from the back, stand up and, and, and say it loud. It preserves. Clap for him. I know that now for you, you are living in Kampala and it's a suburb, so you have fridges and you preserve your meat there. But when I was growing up, for us, we didn't have. We were in a grass thatched house, we didn't have those things. So if daddy bought meat and it was more than we could cook, they would cut it and then put salt into it. And salt would kill the germs. It does. And it would preserve the meat. So salt is a preservative. Salt is going to, if we are becoming the salt of the world, our Uganda will be there tomorrow with dignity. We will preserve it. Our families will be preserved. Our, our, our authority will be preserved. Our beauty will be preserved. Salt of the world. Any other function of salt? What else does salt do? How many of you have been injured? Uh -huh. Yes. It's like medicine. It brings healing, isn't it? When you cut yourself for something very quickly, you do some salt water and wash, it, wash the, the, the cutting because salt, as I said, kills germs. So it brings healing. Any other thing for salt? So we have had three. Test. Giving test to the environment where you are. Preserving people from rotting. Another word for corruption is rotting, actually. When something has gotten rotted, they say it's been corrupted. So, when we are the salt, even corruption will cease because we are the salt of the earth. And then we bring healing. There are so many broken hearts, even among young people. There are so many little girls who keep crying. Oh, so and so at my friend. Now he has left me. And then they are there crying. They can't study their books. I had a classmate. She was almost the only one who failed in our class because the so-called boyfriend had dropped her. There are so many people with broken hearts which need healing. Even the boys, yes, you boys. For the boys, they don't even cry. They hide it in their hearts. And by the time we know it, they are depressed. And by the time they know, we know it, they want to commit suicide. No, you don't have to. You do not have to. Jesus can come into your life. You become the salt and that salt will heal you and when it has healed you, then it will bring healing to the rest of the people around you. So he expects us to be holy, expects us to be sober-minded, expects us to be reverent to him, but also expects us to be the light and the salt. So my beloved friends, it is possible to be holy, not because we have the capacity on our own, but because Jesus is here, who comes into our lives through the Holy Spirit and gives us power to say no to sin and yes to righteousness. Two examples from scripture, and I'll be done. The first one is a young man called Daniel. You know his story? How many know Daniel's story? Daniel? You know the book of Daniel? It's a very nice small little book. If you don't know it, please, after this, as you go home, as you sit back in the car, read the story. It's a narrative. It's a very interesting story. Daniel was in exile. Uh, Israel had been taken into exile in Babylon, and he was there a young man. So they picked on them, 40 of them, to be given government sponsorship by the king to study the literature of the Chaldeans 
because he thought they are from a noble family, they are brilliant, there are some qualities they wanted. So 40 of them qualified, and they got on the course. Now, when they got on the course, uh, the king said, I want them to eat well so that they can excel and be able to do the job I want them to do. So he said, they'll be eating food from my table. But this was a pagan com community where they would first sacrifice to their gods before they cook meat. So Daniel and his three friends, chapter 1, verse 8. Can you imagine? You are in exile. You've been on posho and beans, you know, from uh, United Nations World Food Program. <laughs> now the king, <laughs> the king has given you government sponsorship, eh? And you are supposed to eat the chapat and chips and chicken and whatever it is on the king's table. But Daniel looked through it and said, huh, I'm going to compromise myself. In verse 8, Daniel said, I resolved not to defile myself. Resolving. Other scripture, other versions say, I determined. Daniel determined not to defile himself. I want to tell you that although they laughed at him, even the, the person who was taking care of them was worried, but when they took their stand, three things happened. One, Daniel and his three friends, after 10 days of, of testing them, eating, drinking water and eating greens, they were healthier than the rest. Two, at the end of the course, they were interviewed by the king himself, the forty. The scriptures tell us that those four, Daniel and his three friends, were ten times better in terms of academic excellence than those who indulged. And finally, when you read the book of Daniel, it's Daniel and his friends you read about. Others disappeared. So do you want to be prominent? Do you want to excel? Resolve not to defile yourself. Resolve to be holy as God is holy. Another example is Joseph. You know Joseph, the 11th child of Isaac. Their mother died when they were very young, when he was giving birth to his young brother, Benjamin. But eventually, I will take you to Egypt. So chapter 39, again, it's a very good chapter, read it. He's now a slave in Potiphar's house. And this woman is so, so lustful. Imagine an old woman married to a, a, the commander of the army. He's there lasting. You boys, be careful. <laughs> I don't think the Potiphar's wives ended then. They must still be there. They must still be in this Uganda, these old women who want to hook little boys. Be careful, run for your lives. So uh, Joseph, they, they persuade him, he refuses. In chapter 38, uh, 39, uh, verse 8 and 9, I think, Joseph tells this woman, he says, I cannot sleep with you. Because I will be sinning against God. I cannot betray my boss who gave me a job to sleep with you, his wife. But also, I have a God of my fathers. I cannot sin against him. Friends, young people have demonstrated it. We can. We can be holy. And you know the outcome. Okay? After prison, about 10 years, God made him the prime minister of the biggest country of the time. You know, it was like the current USCs and so on. Why? Because they chose to walk with the Lord in holiness. So it is possible. It is. By the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, it is. It requires us to daily come back to the cross and confess the little things that come to us. But it is possible. I want to thank the Lord so much. That when I was 12 years of age, I was still in primary, I was in P6, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Having grown up going to church because my father was a church warden, the whole family was churchy. My grandparents, my mother's parents used to tell us that they got saved in 1938 when my mother was born. They were catty chests, so there was that church, 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 church. But at that time, I realized that going to church is not enough. I realized that I needed to have a personal relationship with the Savior. And so I surrendered my life to him. I was feeling scared, fearing to confess my sins. But I prayed a short prayer, give me strength, O oh Lord. He did. I stood up. I confessed to be, have accepted Christ. And the Lord showed me who I really was, a sinner. I confessed my sins, and I still do. But he has walked with me. Come end of this month, please prepare my birthday gift on 28th June. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be 66 years. Wow. 
So I usually summarize my testimony in three words. He saves. It's true. If you are honest and you want to work with him, he does. He keeps. He keeps as long as you remain in his enclosure and he satisfies. And by training a high school teacher of chemistry and maths, that was what I graduated with from Makere University. But I've done many things. That's why they call me doctor. By the grace of God, I'm here. One of the scriptures I love is Philippians 1, 6, which says, for I'm convinced of this, that he who began the good work in me, it's him who began it. It's him who convicted me. It's him who revealed to me my sins. He who began the good work in me will bring it to the completion on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. And because I had known the Lord, walked through university, walked through whatever, I got married at age 28, and I was still a virgin. <laughs> Boys and girls, you can remain virgins until God gives you the right person he has prepared for you. So as we close, I would want to challenge any one of us who does not have Christ yet. Suppose Christ comes back today. Would you be among those who would be bowing because they have been friends and they are happy to see him? Or would you be bowing because you are condemned now, no more opportunity? In case you have never known Christ, in case you've just been a good Christian, you have to come back to church with daddy and mom, of course, otherwise you'll be in trouble. And so you are here because what do you do? No, you don't have to. You can receive Jesus. You can be set free. You can be liberated. So if you are here and you want to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, we are going to pray. And as we close our eyes in prayer, you can make that decision. But you could also be here. You got saved some time ago. You've not been walking in holiness. You've not been reading God's word. You've not been, you know, your mind has been on everything and you want to recommit. You still can put your hand up and we pray together. So let us pray. Let us just spend a moment of silence and just think about ourselves. Would we get a well done? Have we been walking holy? Or have we been telling lies? Have we been polluting our minds with wrong pictures? He says, whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. So you can come to him today. You can make that decision which I made. Now 56 years or so ago, 54 I think. You can make that decision today and you will never be the same. You will never regret he's a faithful savior. So if you want to give your life to Christ, this is the moment. The rest of us remain with our eyes closed in prayer. But for you, you can just put your hand up as a sign of Lord, here I am. I want you in my life. I want to be a child of God. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to walk in victory. I want to be a winner, not a loser. Yes, thank you. The rest of us are still praying. Those who are putting up your hands, just put it up. Put it up with confidence. It's your life. It's your life that you are deciding for. It's a great relationship you are coming into. It's something you never regret. Just put your hand up and say, yes, I have made a decision. I don't want to remain where I was. There is a Savior who can take me out of there. He went to the cross exactly for that. He suffered our shame on the cross. He suffered that pain of our sins. Oh, he was just naked and being beaten so that I can be safe. Yes, you are saying yes to the Lord. Just put your hand up in total surrender to him because he knows your heart he knows your struggles he has seen your tears yes just put your hand up well just properly put it up the rest of us remain with our eyes closed and those who have put their hands up kindly stand up just stand up and say I have decided just stand up the rest of us keep your eyes closed 
if it's okay with you, just keep giving thanks to God that he's already in you and he has already liberated you and that you are living in victory. Yes, but those who know that they have not been living right even when they are Christians and they want to totally surrender, just stand up. Just stand up to say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. You know me by name. You were there when I was being formed in my mother's womb. You were there at my birth. You've been there with me. You know my struggles. You know my struggles. I've tried to be good, but things have failed. But here you are the Savior, and you want to do it for me. Thank you, Lord. Can you pray this prayer? Uh, those who have put up your hands and have now stood up, say this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, just say it aloud. Lord Jesus, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you that you can make me holy. I come to you, Lord, with my brokenness, with my pain, with my sins come into my life Lord come into my life Lord forgive all my sins cleanse me cleanse me by your blood Fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Today I have decided to be born again, to be revived, to be holy. Holy Spirit, come, 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 Holy Spirit. Fill me. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for giving me your Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's continue to pray for them as they stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We join the angels in heaven and all the elders. And we give thanks to you and praise for you said when one sinner repents, when he just repents, there is great joy in heaven. Lord, they are standing here to say, yes, we repent. We turn away from where we were. We come to you. Hallelujah. We join the angels and all the heavenly beings to say hallelujah to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords. I surrender them to you, Lord, you who saved me a little girl on my bare feet. You have sustained me through life. You are the Lord. Sustain these children, Lord. Deliver them from whatever has held them captive. We break every chain in their lives in the name of Jesus. We pull down every stronghold in their minds that has been causing them to think that they are unloved, that they are not precious, that they are not variable, that they cannot make it. We pull down those strongholds in the name of Jesus. The strongholds in their personalities, the strongholds in their will that has weakened their will and they are not able to say no. We decree and declare that now the Holy Spirit has come into their lives and they have power to say no to sin and to say yes to righteousness. So Lord, we surrender them to you and give you thanks and praise. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Others can open their eyes. Keep standing. We want to thank God for you. Keep standing. Others can open their eyes. Let us clap the Lord and thank the Lord. Let us thank the Lord. Let us thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Tukute tende reza Yesu. Yesu o mana guandika. Yesu o musa. Sai guna ziza. Newaza o murokozi. I hope the leaders, you've seen them. At the end of the service, kindly take their numbers. I'll wait a little for those who may want to see me uh, on one-to-one. -one, but we thank the Lord. May God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And one more time, let's appreciate her for that.